دوستارم این وطن را دوستارم این وطن را خاک او را ابرهای مست و حیبتناک او را رودهای یاغی و بیباک او را بر فراز کوه ساران آسمان پاک او را دوست دارم این وطن را آمو و مرغاب او را باد او را ابر او را آب او را رستخیز موج از خود رفته و گرداب او را دشت های خشک و گرما کشته و بی آب او را دوست دارم این وطن را ظلمت شبهای او را در نبرد زندگان جاده غمهای او را خلق بی همتای او را در افقهای زمان استاره فردای او را رزم او را فتح او را آینده زیبای او را آینده زیبای او را دوست دارم این وطن را دوست دارم این وطن را بانو بانو جانا او شهر بانو جانا دل مرا بسته به تارگی سجانا دل مرا برده به چشم و عبر جانا دل مرا برده به چشم و عبر جانا درخت پروردین پر شکوف شد جانم دامن ایز گل دارم بشی کس به افشانم ای نسیم جان پرورد امشب از برم بگذر ورنه این چونین پر گل تا سهر نمیمانم ورنه این چونین پر گل تا سهر
Härlig musik. Tack Salsal för dessa afghanska toner. Och god morgon allesammans. Vi är på Globala torget på bokmässan i Göteborg. Ni som kanske en dag går in på Youtube eller Facebook i efterhand ska veta att för oss här så är det söndag morgon och vi samlas till den avslutande dagen på bokmässan. Och vi har det ganska trevligt här för Svenska Afghanistankommittén bjuder på frukost, en typisk afghansk frukost. Och de ska snart också få prata. Eh, Globala torget, det är ju den del av bokmässan där alla de organisationer som på ett eller annat sätt arbetar för att göra världen bättre samlas. En av de organisationerna är ju Svenska Afghanistankommittén som gör oerhört betydelsefulla insatser i Afghanistan där krisen nu är närmast total och där förtrycket av kvinnor bara skärps och skärps. Och, men det vi ska hö höra här om en stund det är ett författarsamtal med den afghanska författaren Nadia Hashimi. Och den som ska leda samtalet är biståndschefen på Svenska Afghanistankommittén, Allan Frisk. Och du vill börja och ta ordet och så släpper du upp Nadja sen. Varsågod Allan, du, ordet är ditt. Och samtalet ska föras på engelska vill jag säga så att ni är beredda på det. God morgon och välkomna. Uh, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, Before uh, I invite our guest on stage, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this session will be held in English. Uh, and we're going, the format will be that uh, Nadia and I will, will speak for, for a few minutes. And I have the privilege to ask the first question. But then we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, because uh, this is also being live streamed on uh, Facebook, Uh, we need to help each other out a little bit with that. So I'll ask those of you who have questions to uh, perhaps stand up and say your question and then I'll repeat your question then. Uh, in, I will try to repeat your question in the microphone. So my, my request, my humble request to you is, is please try to keep your questions short and, and uh, possible for me to repeat so that I understand them. Uh, If you don't have the opportunity to ask your question during the session itself, there will be an opportunity to uh, ask more questions uh, to Nadia myself uh, directly afterwards uh, in the, I think it's called the Tea Talks uh, location. And there you'll also have the opportunity to purchase Nadia's books uh, and uh, have them signed. Uh, it's our honor to uh, welcome Dr. Nadia Hashimi here today. Uh, Nadia is a pediatrician and she's a best-selling uh, novelist. Nadia is born uh, in the U.S. to Afghan parents. Uh, her parents immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1970s. She is the author of several international best-selling novels, uh, including two that we're going to speak about today, uh, The Pearl That Broke Its Shell and When the Moon Is Low. And these are available in Swedish from LG Förlaget. Uh, and the Swedish titles are Perlan som sprängde sitt skal och när natten är som ljusast. So, uh, please join me in welcoming Nadia to the stage. Nadia, great to have you here. Nadia, good morning and welcome. Thanks for coming all this way to talk to us today. No, thank you. It's a real uh, privilege and a pleasure to be here. So good morning to everyone and thanks for joining bright and early. Thank you. I, I thought maybe before we uh, start to talk about your work uh, that I could just ask you, we, we, we had a, a, a meeting last night with members of the, the Afghan community here in Sweden. And I wonder, uh, being a member of, of that community, of the diaspora, If you have any impressions from that that you'd like to share with us, and, and how, how does it feel to be a member of the, the Afghan diaspora now with all that's happened in, in Afghanistan over the last year? Gosh, it gives me a lot to think about. I definitely was not expecting uh, such a warm welcome uh, in coming to a book festival. So this is a first, and I think that 
That's in part credit to Sweden, really, to be able to allow people the opportunity to create those types of celebrations and, and, um, and events together and to retain that culture and to have music welcoming us on stage is something that I have never seen at a book festival like that. So I truly appreciate it. And there's something about the Afghan culture that no matter where I can go in the world, if I can walk in to the familiar sounds and the familiar sense of our food and, and to see those dishes that I recognize from our own gatherings at home, then I can feel very much at home. And I, and I think that that's something that the diaspora has, has appreciated and has learned is that we can help each other to feel at home no matter where we go, and we have to because of just the nature of what has happened to the diaspora and the spread that we have seen internationally. You, you told me yesterday that uh, there are a lot of similarities between the generations that have come uh, into the diaspora. Well, what are some of the differences between some of the different waves, including the, the last one? And I know that you, you work with the number of, of uh, refugees uh, that have come to the United States since the Taliban takeover in August. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, every generation of Afghans who have led, um, people have fled the country or left the country under different circumstances. And so people like my own parents who left for economic reasons, not knowing that you know, by the time they uh, you know, kind of settled in just a little bit, home would be a place that they would not be able to return to. And so there's that sort of surprise departure uh, or surprise inability to return to a homeland. And then there are other people who in the last wave didn't have time to think about leaving, who truly were getting phone calls uh, saying, show up now and you cannot bring anything with you versus other people who in previous generations had to sort of plot and plan and strategize and figure out how they were going to sneak out of the country or make that escape. So, you know, different journeys leaving the country What's very different also is the welcome that people are receiving on the other side. I can, I can speak to the American experience a little bit, hearing from my parents that when they arrived, there were virtually no Afghans living in the United States versus in the wave that has come now. There are many, like me, um, who are there to welcome them, to be able to greet them, to speak to them in their native language, and to help guide them with the experience of my parents' generation and the generations after that. So the resources are a bit different, um, but I think the one thing that stays constant is that, that very deep grief and longing that people hold on to for a homeland. Thank you. Uh, I thought we could start by talking about your, your first novel, and I have my own beat up copy here that went with me to Afghanistan last week, uh, Perlan som sprängde sitt skal. This is a story that's told uh, from the first person perspective of Rahima, uh, and she's a young girl when we meet her. Uh, I wonder if you could sort of introduce this book to us from her perspective, and uh, perhaps you could say a little bit about what it's like being uh, a child in Afghanistan and is it at all different today as, as when, when, when Rahima grew up? So, you know, this, this book actually, the, the English version of it in America came out in 2014. And when I would talk about uh, what the book was about, I would call it a, a novel that was set in post-Taliban Afghanistan for the, for the main part of the story. And, um, you know, at some point in the last year, I was talking about this book and I, that phrase kind of, you know, instinctively wanted to roll off my tongue and it, it just, it cannot be in again because here we are again in a Taliban controlled Afghanistan. So, you know, the, what's, what people find interesting about this book is that it is Rahima's story. It's a girl who is, uh, for a time, her family decides to dress her as a boy and have her disguised as a boy in a custom known as a, a bacha push, a girl dressed as a boy. And, um, and that allows her certain liberties and gives her some freedoms that she might not otherwise have had. We're again seeing that experience for girls where they're being limited by nature of their gender. And it's not to say that in the past 20 years things were absolutely perfect in Afghanistan, but, uh, but I think that there is a, a dramatic and drastic difference in the last year that, that people are definitely feeling. I see it in the messages that I get from people who 
are still in Afghanistan and, uh, and living in this new reality. And the one thing about Rahima in this story that I think is important and I think readers pick up on it as well is that she's drawing strength from the tale of one of her ancestors. And one of her ancestors who was very inspiring to her, a story that's been passed down to her through her aunt, who's another person who's very um, instrumental in her life and in her survival. And I think that also is what we see happening in young people in Afghanistan. That's something that we're all taught, is that we hold our heads a bit higher because of our legacy, and that we know what people before us have been through, what they have endured, what they have survived, and what they have managed to triumph over. And that's what this little girl is doing. I also picked up on that there are a number of strong women, women in this, this book, and uh, Shakiba, who, you, who you mentioned, is uh, her ancestor. And I suppose the other thing that struck me was just the, the, the sort of cruelty that, that young girls experience while they're growing up. And uh, I suppose, is it the, the strong women that, that really save them at the end of the day, that really protect them? The boys are treated completely different. The boys seem to be able to do whatever they want. Uh, but when it comes to girls and, and the, the, I guess the only word that I can find is cruelty, really, that they experience growing up. Uh, do, you, do they see these women as role models or are they their protectors? What, what are the role of, of, of uh, adult women today? Uh, and, and in the book, of course, in, in uh, supporting and raising girls. Yeah, I think that th that's one thing that's made very clear is that, um, you know, by looking at Afghanistan and, and listening to the stories of Afghan women is that the women are there to save themselves. They're not looking to be saved. They're not waiting for, you know, uh, for saviors to kind of gallop in and, and rescue them. The, the, the gains that have been made in the past 20 years were made by women. They were also made with the support of Afghan families, communities, and men, right? And I think it's really, as we did it last night, I think it's important to acknowledge that as well, is that, um, that women do have allies in their families because as much as this, the, the burden is on the Afghan women to kind of pull themselves up, it's impossible to do that completely without having some allies and some people in your corner. And that I think is important for guiding us on, you know, where do we go from here when we talk about Afghan women and girls and, and what do we expect them to be able to do. There's a very intentional oppression of Afghan women right now, and we're sort of all watching it happen. It masquerades as sort of a new quiet that's fallen over the country and a new, you know, peace. But this is really an oppression of half the population. And so as much as we want to see Afghan women and girls come out of this and say they've got the grit and they've got the resilience and they're going to do it on their own, they will need allies to help open doors for them to challenge what's happening, to speak up, and to help bring their voices to, to stages, really. Uh, I was in Afghanistan last week, and I, I had the opportunity to, to meet some boys, and I asked the boys uh, about uh, their views about girls going to school, and, and actually the, the answer I got was, was almost the same every time is, is, of course we think girls should go to school so that they can serve their country. Uh, the boys that I met in, in, in your, your first book, they weren't like that. Uh, they, they seemed to be a bit more uh, just troublemakers and, and they, they, they question a lot of things, but I wonder, is there a role for, for boys uh, in supporting girls and, and, and women? There definitely is, and I, and I think it's also important to acknowledge that the situation for Afghan boys is not perfect. It's far from perfect, right? And they're also living through a society that is denying half of their population uh, some basic rights. They're also being shortchanged uh, by, you know, a proper education, by a society that really will enable them to become anything that they want to be. And so, you know, as much as we talk about what's happening with Afghan girls, I think it's also very important to acknowledge that the situation is far from perfect for, for young Afghan boys who are in their very formative years and, uh, and really deserve to have the same types of, uh, of opportunities as well. And those boys do exist. I think it's hard to, it's hard to portray all the realities in one story. And so this story is not meant to tell the story of all Afghan families. Um, you know, I've had some people pick this up and then ask me, so is this, is this your life story? And I say, no, no, 
far from it. And it's not the story of any individual that I know, although it is a sort of a, a mix of some, you know, of the tragedies that we hear coming out of Afghanistan. But there is no single book, there is no library of books that will ever tell all the realities of, of the Afghan people, of the culture, and of those lived experiences. This is just a sliver of them. No, it's a fascinating story and, and uh, really recommend it from the, the, especially the point of view of girls who really have so little voice uh, today in Afghanistan. Uh, I thought we could talk about uh, your next book, um, When the Moon is Low, and that's called När natten är som ljusast in Swedish. Uh, this is a book that I haven't read, uh, but I think there are some parallels uh, to what's going on today as well. Could you talk a little bit about that and perhaps give us some background to, to what the book is about? Sure, and this, uh, so When the Moon is Low is a book that I wrote, um, it came out in 2000, 15, I want to say. It was just just before we actually saw a, a, a wave of refugees into the world from the Syrian crisis. And I wrote that book because um, at the time I had been sent a newspaper article with a picture of a teenage Afghan boy who was in Greece and he was living in one of the you know um, outdoor areas in Athens and he was there on his own. So he was an unaccompanied minor there, had fled Afghanistan, and was sort of trapped between countries. And he couldn't go back, he couldn't go forward. And so this lack of status and a lack of a pathway was something that really caught my attention. Just to think of you know, what it was like for a teenage boy to be in that situation, so far from home and so, so far from anyone uh, of his family. And so that's a story of... Um, an Afghan family, a mom who has taken her three children, fled a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, and has to make her way to Europe. And, you know, it's one where I really wanted to talk about what that experience was like, something that some of my family members have endured, something that so many of the Afghan diaspora have gone through. And also uh, the experience, I think, of a number of Afghans uh, who live in Sweden today, uh, as we were talking about. Uh, we have a number of... of unaccompanied minors. Is there, is there something specific about the journey uh, of a child? Because you're also a pediatrician, and uh, is there something that, that we can learn, especially from children uh, in these stories, or in, in general, I suppose, when it comes to Afghanistan? I, in a sense, with a country that's so young, 50% of the population is under 18. Uh, this is the future of the country. Is there there's something that they're telling us now that we need to be listening to? I mean, if we, I, I, so I have interacted with and have been working on the issue of the unaccompanied. Um, I've seen some of the, the issues that the unaccompanied minors, even in the United States, people who have arrived in the last year have been dealing with. And, and it's there that you see in its purest form some of the challenges and the trauma that individuals are enduring. Um, when they're unaccompanied, they truly have not only lost homeland, but they've lost that sense of home because, you know, when a family immigrates together, they sort of bring home with them. They have that feeling of home, that aura of home. But when a child comes on their own, they've really lost home. They've lost the people who define home, who create home for them. And that is where I think the children teach us the biggest lessons because we see in them the manifestations of these traumas, of the conflict, what is the impact of conflict? It is really robbing individuals of the security, of that safety, of the confidence that they can wake up and the people that they care most about will be next to them, guiding them through their day. So watching them should really teach us the biggest lessons about forced migration, about what it means uh, for individuals and what it means for those of us on the other side who have the ability to maybe do something about the welcome they receive. On that, uh, and I think this will be my, my sort of last question uh, before we open it up to the audience. Where, where do you see Afghanistan going? Uh, where do you, what, what's, what kind of future do these children have in that country? Gosh, that's a... Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in storytelling, you always want to have a happy ending, right? But it's... I don't, know where, I don't know where the country is going. I know that the situation that it's in right now is not sustainable. And in what we see in the people, we see continued protests on the streets. We see continued protests on social media. 
And I think that there is sort of this deep uprising in the souls of people because they have had a time where they were able to do more, where they were able to be free, where they experienced more. Uh, there's a special kind of joy that you can feel when you walk into this room and you hear the sounds of Afghan music, when you hear the sound of a woman singing, brightly colored. And the yearning for that is not one that will disappear easily in Afghan people. And so you cannot take the music away and expect there to be peace, expect for people to accept that. That will not endure in a very basic way. Um, so I don't know what will instigate the change. I don't know what will come of it. I don't know if it will be a slow and gradual transition. I don't know if it will be something that again happens with another wave of violence. But I know that this current situation, the humanitarian crises that have happened, um, the total lack of provisions for people, the, the rates of unemployment, the stripping away of rights and liberties of Afghan women and girls, uh, this cannot endure, and it will not endure because the will of the Afghan people is very different. Thanks very much, Nadia. We're going to uh, open up uh, the floor for questions, uh, and I've taken a few liberties ask, uh, asking questions about Afghanistan in, in, in specific, but I'd also really encourage us to take this opportunity to talk to, to Nadia about her work, uh, and especially those of you who, who have read her, her novels. So I think we have our first question here. Yeah. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to repeat all of the questions into the microphone for the audience and also for those of you watching on the live stream. So this was uh, a question about the current protests uh, taking place in Iran. And uh, Nadia, I think you heard the question. So is there anything that we can learn from those protests uh, in the context of Afghanistan? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's been very inspiring the world over to see the, the women uh, in Iran and, and really the, the people of Iran coming out and protesting um, in support of uh, the rights of women, right? The, the ability of a woman to decide what she chooses to wear over her hair or not wear or to her ability to exist in public. And, and those same sentiments are echoed in the protests that we see in Afghanistan. And I would argue that the same protests that we see in the United States and other countries where women are getting up and standing up for their rights. And, uh, and I always try to make those connections because these are the same fundamental values that are driving people into the streets um, no matter where we go. Uh, that, what breaks my heart is that it's dangerous for them to do so and we see that, right? So there are people from Iran to Afghanistan who in the protests are risking their lives. Some people have lost their lives in uh, the payback that comes afterwards, the, the detentions, the interrogations, the threats, and, uh, and the things that are done to them behind the scenes even. But I hope that they will have an impact. Um, we see it now. I think what's good about social media is that those images are everywhere and they're rather undeniable, right? And that's why you see efforts to shut down the internet because that visibility is so powerful and so dangerous. Um, and that's why I'm hopeful that the energy will move from one area to another, that it will come together, and that will inspire and, and sort of enable some sorts of change. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have other questions from the audience? Yes, please.
Thank you. So the, the question is about the scenes from the airport in Kabul uh, last year. And the, the question to Nadia, as I understand it, is how do you feel as an Afghan, but also as an American, uh, witnessing these scenes, which we've seen before in other contexts like Vietnam, uh, Iraq, where uh, people are fleeing for their lives uh, and trying to board American aircraft uh, in order to, to save themselves? Well, so at the time that that was unfolding, at the time that it was happening, we sort of um, had a very quiet home. We had uh, this sort of weird silence that had fallen over all of us. And uh, at the time, I was also involved with certain groups who were trying to help evacuate people. And, you know, we had spreadsheets. We were collecting lists of names of people who were at risk and some of the women activists, some of the family members, people who had worked in different capacities and who would be threatened by this new terrorist regime that was coming into power. So at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of thinking that was going on. There was just a lot of... Um, not much sleeping and a lot of you know phone calls and messages and trying to get something done. Um, right now, reflecting back on it, I think there was also a lot of outrage, uh, a lot of disbelief that something like that could happen again, that we're not learning any lessons from history. And from the American side, um, just a total disbelief that we could have a presence there for 20 years to have so much of that strategized and plotted out and planned and then the departure to look like such a disaster, like such a complete fallout mess of uh, just a lack of orchestration from the top. So, um, so there's a, a lot of mixed feelings about it and I hope that there will be some lessons learned so that something like that does not happen again. And I think what we were seeing on the ground, and not just from the images, but really from the phone calls from uh, my cousins who were there at the airport at the time trying to get out, from other relatives, was just pure desperation. Sort of this knowing that like the window was closing and that you had this much of an opportunity to possibly get out. And so that's what you saw happening at the airport was sort of that clawing for a chance of freedom. Um, some people sort of feeling the country take its last gasps of air. Uh, and unfortunately for so many of them, they did not make it through. For many people who were at the airport, it also became a very traumatic place. There was that bombing who, you know, I've met several families who uh, experienced that bombing at the airport and who had some members of their family make it through the gates and the other members be left on the other side. And so we've got some families who have been completely divided in the United States where, um, you know, the mom is there with two children and two children and the husband are left behind in Kabul and what do they do now? So there's just, it's been, um, it was a very tragic moment in the story of the presence in Afghanistan and for the people of Afghanistan. The United States' longest war came to an end after 20 years. Uh, when I was uh, in Afghanistan, I talked to a lot of people who said that they experienced some eerie sense of peace nevertheless, that there was some at least lack of violence in the, in the country and that uh, opened some doors for them and that, that uh, women were not uh, as, as afraid to travel, for example, uh, that uh, people could go to, to work. Um, aid agencies, we have access now to, to areas of Afghanistan that we were never able to access before. Have you heard any of these types of stories and, and what's, your, what's your sense of the, from the people that you talk to about what this, this mood is like in this, we can't call it peace, but lack of war? Uh, and then I suppose, are we going to be able to read about that in a, in a coming book? So, you know, it's, I think, important to acknowledge that multiple things can be true at once, right? Yes, there can be fewer bombings and fewer drone attacks and, and uh, civilian casualties. And at the same time, that the quiet or the silence that we might be seeing in Afghanistan should not be misconstrued as peace, right? O oppression and the silencing of a, peace of a people is not the same thing as peace for a people. Um, it, it's, it's difficult when we try to tell both realities and not look like we are trying to forgive what's happening, right? 
the, the situation in Afghanistan right now is one in which we have to acknowledge that the people are being silenced. They're, you know, why is it that the women feel more comfortable traveling now? Yes, there may be less conflict, but that's because the country has been turned over to one regime. And, and they're really, you know, aside from some pockets in the center of the country, there really are not people there battling for the country right now as they had been in the past 20 years. So, um, so yes, there have been some absolutely horrific casualties because of the foreign presence in Afghanistan, because of the United States' presence there, and the over-the-horizon strategy has been a very really dangerous one where they use drones instead of having people on the battlefields. But at the very same time is the reality that this situation, again, is very toxic for the Afghan people. Limiting the, um, the ability of women to be in public does not mean that, yes, they're safe and happy in their homes. Do we have more questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, so the question was about uh, girls' education, uh, particularly for uh, high school-aged uh, girls and also for uh, female uh, employees of the, the health sector, uh, as far as I understand. If it's okay, Nadia, I'll just say a, a quick word about the Swedish Committee's work in that. Uh, the Swedish Committee this year is celebrating 40 years of operations in, in Afghanistan and our high schools for girls are still open uh, today. So we have 16,000 girls who are studying at the secondary school level in our schools. Uh, and that's possible by, uh, due to a certain amount of uh, acceptance uh, for this in the local community. And of course we have uh, female staff, my colleagues, who work in the health uh, sector as well. Uh, but Nadia, wh what do you think? I mean, wh obviously uh, education, this is the, the, you know, the most essential requirement for, 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 for children to grow up and, and to, to, to learn and contribute to society or to serve their country, as this boy said. What, what's, what's your view uh, on the importance of, of higher education for girls? And do you have any stories uh, of your own uh, that you can share with us about that? Yeah, and we're not even talking about higher education, right? We're talking about like a very basic level of education that, yes, is available to some girls because there are programs that, that make it available through private schools. Um, I, I sit on the board of two foundations that also provide uh, a degree of private education. So we, we support programs that provide education. So those girls are still able to go to school. And the situation across the country is different depending on where people live. And, and that cannot be. You cannot make it so that only some of the girls have access to an education and that if it's private it has to be supported by outside groups who are funding this or by families who have the means in Afghanistan to actually pay for it. Like some of our relatives are still able to send their girls to school because they send them to a private school where they get a different type of education. But that is not sustainable and that does not nurture a country that needs everyone to be educated. If you don't have women who are working in various fields, like healthcare as you pointed out, what type of healthcare access are the women going to have? You already have a severe scarcity of resources and so to further undermine the country itself is sort of mind-boggling and speaks to the lack of leadership, to the, the poor planning uh, on the side of the leadership. 
um, it's also just not in line with anything that any other country on this planet is doing for its girls, regardless of what religion they practice or what, what uh, theology is sort of at the foundation of the country. And you know what's going to change? I don't know, because even within the Taliban leadership, as we were talking about yesterday, there are people who want to send their daughters to school, and yet the country is sort of locked and strangled. Um, I also have deep concerns about the type of education that the boys would be receiving in the public schools as well, and how much of it is a solid, true education, and how much of it has a very, you know, sort of militant and, and um, theological bent to it that is really not going to support the nation and its growth as well. So there are, there are some real deep problems there. Um, I will say that in, in the past year I had a, a good chunk of time where I was spending time working with the Afghan children who had come to the United States and the one thing that they were so hungry for because they were sort of in this limbo situation in uh, military bases and even some in hotels and different places and so we started doing classrooms for them. We started uh, just, I realized that one of the biggest needs was for education, that these children wanted to wake up and go to school. And so uh, we started these classrooms and these kids would come in and I, I remember taking everything that I had in my house, sort of like my kids' notebooks and everything and went out and bought a bunch of stuff. And we just started teaching. And they would walk in and you could see in their eyes, I mean, I had to record it one day, the sound of these children, because when I opened the door, I was like this cheering crowd of children saying, good morning, teacher, good morning, teacher. And they wanted so much to learn. They had a, like a hunger for it that you've not seen anywhere else. And people who had worked with the Afghan children, the Americans who had worked with them, I had somebody call me and say, um, that group is now gone. We really want to work with Afghan children. Where can we find them? <laughs> And so I think there's something that people really appreciated just in the spirits of Afghan children that would pull them in. And these are the kids who are the same kids who are in Afghanistan, who want to learn, who want to greet their teacher, who want to learn the alphabet and how to add things. Um, I remember teaching children, like drawing a picture of a house and an apartment, teaching them the English languages. And I asked one of the children, you know, I drew a picture of a little stick house and I said, what is this? And he said, teacher, teacher. And he said it in English, he said, this is a single family home. <laughs> almost as if he was using the language of a real estate agent. So these are bright children. They are bilingual, they're trilingual, they uh, have ambitions when you ask them what they want to be, but they just need the opportunities. So I feel very good for the ones who have arrived in different places around the world, um, but my heart is breaking for those, the boys and the girls who are still there and sort of trapped in a situation where they, they will not get the education that would empower them to actually help their country. And it's interesting, uh, if you look at the characters in your, in your first novel, uh, the, the children, and, and you know, they themselves, I think if you ask children in general if they want to school, they want to go to school. And so the, the girls in Rahima's family, this, this was a big topic of discussion uh, for them. You know, is it possible for us to go to school today? Oh, Rahima, you're lucky now that you're dressed as a boy, you get to go to school. That was one of the, the, the major benefits, I think, from her perspective that she, she got to, to go to school um, with the boys then and, and also to play uh, in the streets. Um, I, I guess my, my question is, is, why is this such a big threat to the, the, the Taliban, uh, allowing girls to get educated? What's their thinking? Because in the, the discussions in Rahima's family, it's, it's sometimes it's about, well, it's not safe for the girls to go to school. They can't, uh, they can't uh, walk uh, alone to go to school. And then we hear explanations now, I think, from the regime saying, well, it's not a part of our culture, which is obviously not true, uh, given the, the history of, of girls as education in the country. So what's your, your thought about that? What, what's, what's the threat here? And, and what is it that we can do to to reclaim the narrative around that? I mean, I, I, I can't speak to the mindset of a, a Taliban, for sure. As much as I try, I, that's by even the imagination of a writer, I could not. But I think that the threat to them, if in my, um, just kind of looking at the situation, would be that they're going to be overthrown. They're going to be overthrown by that girl who gets an education. Um, because they're no match for them, right? I mean, a lot of these people have no education. The people who are in the Taliban leadership really do not have an education. 
they are not learned people, they're not scholars, they're not academics. Um, and so, you know, what do they have behind them other than the force uh, oppression of other people? Uh, so that I think is the only thing that they have. And, and it's still, they, they think they recognize the importance of education if they want it for their own children. But they also are recognizing that if they were to allow for a proper education for the full population of the country, that that country then would not tolerate them. And it would have the means by which to overthrow them, um, to either vote them out or, or whatever it is, but to strategize their way to a better place. This, this Taliban cannot rule over a learned population, over a population that has the confidence of a very basic education. I think that's a good place to, to stop. And I'd like to say uh, thank you once again. Let's give Nadia a big round of applause, please, for being with us and coming all the way from the US. Uh, and just to remind you that uh, her books, Perlen som sprängde sitt skal, and Nær natten som ljusast are available from uh, LG Förlag. Uh, they have a booth uh, downstairs uh, and that will also be having a book signing uh, and an opportunity to uh, answer more questions at the, I think it's called the Tea Talks uh, space uh, just over there, uh, which is behind another booth uh, that is occupied by the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan. So. Uh, the Swedish committee is also uh, here today and you can meet members of our staff and also of our uh, local association in uh, Göteborg. So thank you uh, once again to all of you for coming and thank you to all of you who have joined us uh, on the live stream on Facebook and thank you once again uh, Nadia Hashimi for joining us today for this, uh, this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks to everyone again who has joined and to the Swedish committee for this beautiful spread, to the music, to the musicians who uh, joined us today. Uh, it's truly been a really warm event, so thank you everyone. <laughs>